Oh, unbelievable. Norman Wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, as sprightly and as fun-loving as ever. An 89-year-old boy, a scrapper, a fighter, a performer. Never happier than when he's the centre of attention. Vinsdale? Vinsdale, you all right? Hey? Oh, my last seconds are ticking away, pet candy. Oh, no. Yes, I can hear him. How long will the ambulance be? Oh, uh, about 18 feet, Mr. Grimstow. Don't laugh at me, cause I'm a fool. I know it's true, yes. I'm a fool. <laughs> no one seems to care. No but no I give the world to share no my but, life. No but calm down. We oh. need a chat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Now, here we are in the lovely Astor Theatre in Deal. You're the patron of this place. What does Deal mean to you, Sir Norman? What kind of memories does it conjure up? Lovely, because when I was a kid, I had an extremely tough time, because up until that time, I had no proper place to live. I was hungry. It was the most important part of my life. And how old would you have been then? What age were you? Nine, nine years of age, and I lived just off Middle Road. My parents were divorced, my mother left home, my father was a chauffeur, he used to be away for weeks and sometimes months, and uh, there was a house we had at that time at Fernhead Road in Paddington, London. I was left in the house with nobody to look after me and no, nothing to eat. Kids at school used to give me some food. In the finish my father picked me up, he must have felt sorry for me, took me to some people near Hatfield, and that was all right. I remember as, as I went into their place, they were talking about the money that they were charged to look after me. And about eight or nine weeks later, my father hadn't paid them at all and they chucked me out. Onto the street? Is that they just chucked me out. My father came and picked me up and, and I finished up a deal and he didn't pay the people here, but they were sorry for me and they kept me. God bless him. So Norman was rescued and settled in Downs Road with the Blanche family. And you got your first glimpse of filmmaking here, didn't you? Oh, they were, they were, they were making a film up of the lifeboat. And I just came to watch. But of course, it wasn't quite as simple as that. Norman actually sneaked out at night in his pyjamas. And his long-suffering foster parents didn't even know that he'd gone until he knocked on the door the next morning chilled to the bone, worn out, and asking what was for breakfast. But he caught a glimpse of an excitement that was going to last him all his life. This used to be where your school was, then? We are now in Canada Road. They've knocked the school down and built those flats. We're there should all... be a plaque up there, Norman, saying, oh. so Norman Wisdom went to school here and played football. <laughs> and were you ever a mischievous pupil? No, I used to do as I was told, and I was happy to try and learn arithmetic and writing, and I was just keen on being alive and, and uh, having something to eat now and again. <laughs> Given his own background, family means a lot to Norman Wisdom. This week he's staying with his sister-in-law Chris at her home in Deal. And his children Nick and Jackie have come to visit. He says, he, what he does, he says, oh, we're going to watch this film, right? Falls asleep. Yeah, and then we, we don't want to watch it. So we watch it because he wants to watch it. And after 10 minutes he's, he's flat out in the chair. So you can have what you want. You work. I know somebody else like that. Who? It's not a good film. It doesn't actually it's make like any normal. difference because even if Dad's awake, he'll keep flicking from channel to channel, so you never get to see anything through from start to finish anyway. So... Norman's nephew Peter and his son Tom are also here. Chris was married to Norman's brother Fred, who died in 1971. Were they close? Yes, very. They had a lot of jokes and laughs. Norman was very determined, wasn't he? I mean, he wanted to make good, and he did. I mean. Really, when you think of what they went through, how well both of them turned out. Norman's first job, and even this sounds like the script for one of his films, was here 
at one of the local grocers, Lipton's, as an errand boy. And while I was being uh, considered for the job, they said, you can ride a bicycle, can you? And I said, oh, yeah. But I've never <laughs> ridden a bicycle with that. And I remember I, only a couple of weeks later, I, I burst into a car. <laughs> But still, I was a, a good errand boy, fast delivery, eight shillings a week, and then I got a sort of reputation for that, and, and that's why the home colonial people came. They asked me if I'd like the job, and they gave me ten shillings a week, and I took the job. Nice pay rise then. Oh, yeah. So even as a kid, Norman was ambitious. He left Deal for the bright lights of London and a job as a bellboy. Of course, the streets of London are paved with gold, so for Norman, it must have been easy. Well, it was easy, if you call working a 12-hour shift at a hotel at the age of 13, easy. But that was nothing compared to what happened next. Norman set out to walk from London to Wales. One of the boys was Welsh, and he said to me one day, why don't we go and work down the mines? And I said, well, why? And he said, well, of course, it, it's a much better job, it's much more interesting, it'll be fun to do, it'll be nice, and, and the money's much more, much, much, much better. So, and I remember I said to him, well, where, where, where will I live? And he said, well, you can live with me and my parents. And so we started the next morning, went down to the kitchen at the Ladies' Forum Club and, and filled a, 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 a package full of sandwiches and cake and stuff like that and took us and we walked all the way 181 miles except we had one lift I remember we were doing that as a, as a car passed and the car stopped which others hadn't stopped and it was a lady driving and so and uh, she said get in so we got in and we thought we were going to Cardiff <laughs> she went about a mile stopped at her <laughs> house and, we, and dropped us off <laughs> When we got to Cardiff, it was very disappointing because he decided that his parents wouldn't let me come and live with him. So he left me and I was out of work and, and left. And I walked down to the docks and I saw eight or nine fellows sitting, it was lunchtime, and they were having sandwiches and tea. And I went over to them and just looked like that. And, and they could tell that I was hungry. And so they, they gave me a sandwich. They also gave him a job as a cabin boy. They showed me the cabin where I'd be, which was shared with two other blokes. And that was it. Two days later, I was off on the, on the boat, of course, on, on, on the way to the Argentine. Were you frightened at all, Norman? Because there you are, a 13-year-old lad, no real family to speak of. You've walked out of a job in London all the way to Wales, you've got nowhere to stay and you're offered this chance to travel. Were you, were you frightened or was it exciting? No, it was exciting. I was 14, not 13. <laughs> so Norman set out on his career as a seafarer and discovered that after he'd finished peeling the potatoes, he had some time to spare. I would watch the crew doing their exercises on board and then they used to do boxing. I was interested in watching the boxing, so much so that I used to get close, and one day one of them said, you want to go, son? And I said, oh, no, 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 thank you. And he said, oh, well, we, we won't hurt you. And I, I said, oh, well, and he said, look, well, the gloves are soft. When you get hit with those, they don't hurt you. And so I said, oh, all right, then. So they put the gloves on, and they taught me how to box, and I enjoyed it. I've always loved sport, and I enjoyed it, and they were amazed at the way I learned to box. And when we got to the Argentine, they took me to a boxing booth, and put me in against a bloke who was, they, they inquired if anybody wanted to challenge him. And if, it was only three rounds, but if you were still on your feet at the end of the third round, you got some money. Did you make it? Uh, yeah, I'd been bashed. I was still on my feet though, and I'd been knocked down and got up again. <laughs> I, I, I thought my nose was broken, it was blood pouring. <laughs> and my mouth was pouring open. <laughs> I had an eye that went black completely, it was swelling up. <laughs> but I, I still, and I'd been knocked down several times, but I was still standing up, 
And this is honestly true that, that when I'd finished the third round, I knew I'd run some money. And I jumped out to the wing ring to, to go to the crew because they'd taken me there. And I couldn't find them anywhere. There we are. So I, I thought, well, I won't bother. I went to collect the money. And that was it. The crew had collected the money and shoved off. <laughs> I went back to the ship uh, and I went upstairs and to, there was a, one sailor on, on guard, make, making sure nobody came aboard who wasn't allowed. And he saw the state I was in and he just caressed the top of my head, ruffled my hair was all night, and I looked up, looked up and smothered with blood and he bent down and he kissed me. I broke away from him and, and as, I, as I went away he came to get hold of me and I ran and he chased me all round the deck and there was an officer left on board to look after the ship. He saw what was happening and he knew why this bloke was chasing me and as the bloke came round the corner after me the officer smashed him in the face with a shovel. Take it from me, that guy never chased Norman again. But it wasn't all plain sailing. When the ship came back to Cardiff, there was no job for cabin boy Norman. So I walked back to London by myself. I've got a couple of decent lifts, by the way. And when, when I got to London, just before London, I'd made a big decision. I was going to look for my father. And, you know, I, I didn't know where he lived, but I knew where my grandmother was. And I looked up and said, hello, Grandma. And, Norman, I haven't seen you for years. And, and, uh, and she took me and gave me something to eat. And then she gave me my father's address and also told me that he'd married another lady. So there we are, I, and it was Earl's Court. I knocked on the door, the lady came out, said, yes, what do you want to see? And I told her who I was. Uh, and she couldn't believe it about her husband's previous wife's son. And anyway, anyway, she said he wouldn't be back until about five. It was about half past four then. At just about before five, I heard some arguments in the hall, you know, like sort of, well, what are you doing? Well, I don't want to have any argument. They would tell him, and, and she, I heard her say, but he's your son, you know, things like that. Well, then the door opened, and my father came in, and I stood up, and I said, hello, Dad. And he just pointed to the front door and said, out. And I walked to him and I said, but I'm your son and you're my father. And this is honestly true. He said, get out and slap my face. I went, opened the front door, walked down the steps and, and I stopped at the bottom of the steps and looked back and he was standing at the door and then he slammed the door in my face and I no, I, I stood there. And I remember I said, I will never, ever see you again. And I never did. So Norman's mum had left him. His dad had rejected him. At 14, he was truly alone in the world. I went to Victoria Station, because there's some places all around there you can get a decent kip at night. And there was a coffee stall there that was open all night and I went to the coffee, I had about tuppence left in the pocket and so I had a, a cup of tea and then he said, don't you want anything to eat? And I said, I, I haven't got any more money. And I remember that bloke pushed me hot pie and then he was talking further and he said to me, why don't you join the army? I can't get in the army at my age. Uh, and he knew I was 14 because I told him already and he said yes you can get in, into the band when you're 14 and I said yeah but I don't know anything about music he said well kid him at least try and he told me where to go which was the, was the recruiting centre in Whitehall a bandmaster was there and I had to talk to him he said you'd like to be in the band would you and I said yes please sir and he said you know all about music don't you and I said oh yes sir and I remember he said to me, what, what's a flat? And I said, um, don't know that one, sir. He said, well, what's a sharp? And I said, funny enough, I haven't come across that one either, sir. And that man looked at me and he said, you don't know anything at all about music, do you? And I knew it was just going to be chucked out. And I put on 
what I consider is probably the best act in my life. I looked at that man and I said, no, sir, but I'd like a chance to learn because then as I grow up, I'll, I'll be able to have somewhere to live. I can buy some food and maybe I can get to know people. And I, and I cry and really was, and on my word of honour, I saw that man looking at him, he had tears running down his cheek and he suddenly said, all right, I'll take you. I think there is a straight actor in Norman trying to get out. He's always said to me he would love to play the same sort of character that John Mills did in Ryan's Daughter or that Daniel Day-Lewis did in My Left Foot. That's the sort of role he'd like to play just to show people that he is a very talented actor. And about a week, a week or two, ten days, something like that, afterwards I was on a troop ship on the way to India. I thought to myself, this is going to be the time of my life. And it was. How important was the army in his life, do you think, Jackie? Everything. Absolutely everything to him. It installed discipline in him. It, um, it, it, it taught him the instruments that he plays. He travelled because of the army. Um, everything. It was the army a lot, really. He, he loved it. He just, he, I mean, he will just stand there and say, I owe everything to the army. I owe everything to the army. I have my own bed, wonderful food, marvellous mates, and I was learning all about music. Norman never does anything by halves, so by 1936 he was flyweight champion of the British Army in India. Ooh! Ooh. Yes, I mean, I think he was flyweight champion of the army. I don't think there were many flyweights in the army, actually. I I think he went straight into the semi-finals. But where did the comedies come from? When did you start mucking about and getting laughs? Whilst I was doing the boxing, I used to be in the gymnasium and boxing, and there'd be other blokes who were doing all sorts of exercises, and I did the boxing with an imaginary opponent. Shadow boxing, it's called. <laughs> and then I'd get knocked down flat, and the blokes were screaming with laughter, you see. <laughs> hey! And one day they brought the entertainment officer in and he stood there watching me and he said, Wisdom, that is in the concert party. And you know, I was in the concert party doing all that and I learned other things and that's, that's how it all started. And then the Second World War broke out. As an experienced soldier, Norman expected to soon be indispensable to the war effort to serve his country in the front line. Uh, well, no, it was on telephones because I'd learned to operate a telephone switchboard and uh, I was transferred to the Royal Corps of Signals, stationed at Cheltenham, and then one night did a charity show at Cheltenham Town Hall. And after the show, in the dressing room, there was a knock on the door. The door opened and a gentleman stood there. And I say gentleman because he was, because he beckoned me over. And I went over and I said, yes. And he said, are you a professional? And I said, no. Why? He said, well, if when you leave the army you don't try to become a professional, you must be raving mad. And I looked at that man and I, I just said, thank you. That gentleman's name was Rex Harrison. The war over, Norman had to try and earn a living. 
so why not try and earn it on the stage? And it worked, not that it was easy. I went to Collins Music Hall in Islington and I asked to see the manager and he came, when he came out, he said, yes, what do you want? I said, oh, I'd like to go on the stage, please. And he said, well, well, what have you done? I told him and he said, oh, don't be silly, I, I need professionals. And I took a room nearby and for two weeks I became that man's shadow. Honestly, I mean that. I mean, if he was in the bar and he lifted half a pint of beer to his mouth, my head was under his elbow. <laughs> <coughs> Until in the finish, he said, look, if I let you go on First House Monday and you're no good, will you promise to go away and leave me alone? And I said, I promise. I went on First House Monday. Nobody came round and said, well done. But nobody came round and said, get out. So I went on Second House and did better still. And then I was on on Tuesday. He knew that if he badgered people enough, to give him a chance, and once he got that chance, he took it with both hands. On the Wednesday night, there was a knock on the dressing room door after the second house show, and um, I, I said, come in, and there was two or three other people, and a bloke came in and, and, and I said, yes, well, he said, where are you working next week? I said, nowhere, why? He said, well, I'd like to book you for the Portsmouth Coliseum. I got an engagement. Another knock on the door and I said, come in, and the bloke said, where are you working next week? And I said, Portsmouth Coliseum. Oh, he said, well, when would you be available after? And I, I said, well, I'll just have a look at my diary. <laughs> <laughs> and I went out to look at the book on the thing and, and he, book, he, he booked me for Grand Theatre Brighton, that's right. And then whilst I was there, uh, a, a bloke came to me and he said, I'd, I'd like you to do a charity show. Oh, I said, oh, certainly, yes, I've done a lot of them. He said, yes, but this one is at, the, is at the Victoria Palace, London. Victoria Palace. Oh, and top of the bill was Laurel and Hardy, Vera Lynn, wow. George Doon and Clarkson Rose, Nat Jackley, wonderful name at that time. I couldn't believe the laughs I got. And then the applause, so much so, as I walked off stage, the stage, the stage keeper, he pushed me back on stage for some more applause. I got some more applause, couldn't believe it. And as I came off, I walked in the wings, and there was a lady there, and as I passed her, she kissed me. And I turned round, and it was Vera Lynn. Norman works damn hard at being a naturally funny man. Like every great actor. He does make you believe you're seeing it for the very first time. He makes you believe he's making it up as he goes along. And he's not. It's just brilliantly observed and brilliantly rehearsed and brilliantly acted. You practice all night. You practice all night. Um, and, uh, you know, until it was right, he wouldn't stop. He also says he's very lucky, but I think, you know, you bring your own luck and hard work can bring luck. Then, one night, late in the 1940s, while he was on stage, Norman's mother, the mother who had left the family home, and him, 20 years before, came back into his life. Oh, <coughs> Shepherd's Bush Empire, which was a the theatre. Then, I was doing my show, and at the end, the cast was on stage, and then there's a voice right up from the gods so now on the top shelf. Now, well done, Norman Wisdom! Congratulations, Norman Wisdom! Shouting and all that, and all the cars were laughing at stuff. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the curtain came down, and after the show, the stage door keeper came and said, the lady would like to see you. And I said, oh, well, yeah, good, tell her to come in. And so, And he brought her into the dressing room, and it was my mother who'd been shouting, well, where's my mother? And I never let her go. How did you feel, Norman, when you saw your mother again after 20 years? Oh, well, wonderful. Wonderful, because I'd been thinking about her all the time. <coughs> and it was marvellous. Did you feel any kind of anger about her or resentment? Did you think where had she been all that time? Well, I had regrets, but I didn't. I wasn't angry with her because I, I, I don't know whether it was her fault or my father's fault that they quarrelled so much and that she, they split up. Uh, and uh, it was nothing to do with me. Norman bought this flat for his mother Maud 
on the seafront between Woolmer and Deal. Nice flat, that, and beautiful view of the sea and everything else. Even when he was a star, he wanted her close, close to him. I mean, she, she came to Broadway and watched the, op um, the opening night. Um, she would come to uh, premieres. She would be on his side, really, a pillar of strength. Looking through the old pictures, you know, she was always in them. She was there. I think she enjoyed the spotlight. Granny Maud was the most amazing character, which I'm sure Dad's got an awful lot of his little antics from. Um, she'd be the only one that could get away, though, by giving him a, like, clip around the ear or anything like that. No one else would dare do it. As a kid, I can remember going up to my grand's house and she was... She'd dance, wouldn't she? She would dance. And she could do the splits. Yeah, and this know? is at the age yeah. of... Oh, God. 70. 70 yeah. then, yeah, and then. she would dance for us and then do the splits and then... And we'd watch that before we got our shilling uh, every Sunday afternoon when we were going, went up to see her. So sixpence. It was, uh, oh, sixpence. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was uh, she was a character, yeah. Interesting when you come to think of it that he forgave the mother who left him. I know, yes. That's true. She was very lucky in that. But she passed away in 1971 in that flat. <laughs> But Granny Maud had lived long enough to see her son Norman become one of Britain's biggest stars, achieved with the help of a funny cap and a local charity shop. We'd never seen anybody quite like Norman in that funny little suit, which of course was as famous as Chaplin's bowler and, and, and Kane. And I started in concert party, you know, a concert party called Out of the Blue. Now that is the show where Norman got the suit and invented the gump, the character. He was in the show with David Nixon, and they used to do five different shows. Now, Norman had enough for four different shows. When it came to the fifth show, he hadn't got anything left. He didn't know what to do, and David Nixon said, why don't we do the old routine of the country of getting the kid up out of the audience? Oh, that's a good idea. So Norman went around the junk shops, got himself this little suit, up he came, and that was the start of a whole new persona for Norman. For more than a decade in the 1950s, Norman was a hot property. Even Marilyn Monroe came to watch him work on the Pinewood film set. I came out of my dressing room one morning and she was coming down the hall the other way. I was a bit embarrassed, you know, to say anything to her, but she got opposite me and was going like that. And suddenly she laughed, darted across, grabbed hold and kissed me. Marilyn Monroe kissed me. His comedy not only bridges generation but is timeless in its delivery. He was a very honest entertainer. He wasn't about getting up on stage and pretending to be something that the audience wanted to see. He was about getting up on stage and exaggerating his own personality and characteristics. The clown am I. What do I know of life? Why can't I cast away this mask of play and live my life? Why can't I fall in love till I don't give a damn? And maybe then I'll know what kind of Norman was a hit on both sides of the Atlantic. He apparently had everything, a beautiful wife Frida, a son and a daughter, and success for the taking, both in Britain and on Broadway. Sometimes his family were with him, more often they were not. But hard as you try, it's just not possible to do everything 110% all the time. Something has to suffer. After 18 months in the States, Norman came home an international star but his wife, Frida, had moved on. He was doing very well over there, wasn't he? And then he had to come back for the children's sake. Yeah, I think he, he, it was an unfortunate timing because he was just, whether it was a conscious decision or not, but he was just starting to crack America um, when Frida left. And, and as Mum said, he came back um, 
for the family. It was a hard time in everybody's life. I felt that my world had fallen apart. I couldn't imagine life without mum and dad being together. Um, it affected me quite badly. Uh, it affected my work at school. He probably won't thank me for this, but it was probably almost, almost inevitable because he was away so much. And, uh, you know, my, my mother did meet somebody else and, um, and th they parted. <laughs> she found someone else who was better than me. When he did come back, unfortunately, I think he lost the opportunity of cracking the American scene uh, as big as the next person did, which was Peter Sellers. And I think Peter Sellers filled in the gap that Norman had lost through coming back to look after the kids. Do you think there's any sense in which the fact that your father was so brutal with you and turned his back on you that you were obviously never going to lose touch with your children, that was never going to happen? Was that part of what made you want to be with them and, and almost sacrifice the career in America for that? No, I don't think so. I didn't think of it that way at all. I just loved my children. I loved them, that's all. Amid the personal difficulties, Norman's career continued to boom in Europe. His films were massive successes in the, in the early 50s onwards. A new Norman Wisdom film, it was like a new Beatles album coming out. Paul, can I first say what a pleasure it is to meet you. Now, when did you first become aware of Norman Wisdom? I first saw Norman Wisdom on the big screen when I was seven or eight. I was growing up in East London and they re-released some of his movies. This was the early 60s and they put them out as double bills and they were just fantastic. And I remember waves of kids going in and screaming with laughter. We were moved by the pathos. We loved the songs because they were corny and cheesy, but they were the kind of songs we'd heard on the telly. And he was just fantastic, a force of comedic nature. You really are a workhorse. What's been the toughest, the busiest time you've had, do you think, ever? Well, from, from about 1950 to about 1968. Just those 18 years of being very busy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, it's Norman here, and I'm reading from the front page of the East Kent Mercury, Thursday, 4th of March. Norman Wisdom works hard for charity. He's patron of a number of organisations in Deal, including the Astor Theatre and the Talking Newspaper for the Blind. Lieutenant Colonel Davis pledged to speak to people involved about its future. And he added, my reaction to the site was instantaneous. Within a few hours of visiting the garden, I was giving a very emotional... It's partly because of this charitable work that he was awarded the OBE in 1995 and a knighthood in 2001. Do you want me to do it again? No, no, that's fine. He's a very patriotic man. Even the solemnity of a royal investiture didn't quite make Sir Norman Wisdom behave. But at least his antics left the Queen amused. Apparently she and the Queen Mother are ardent Wisdom fans. He was obviously very proud and he was the last one to imagine that it would happen, uh, that he would get honoured like that. I think he was, he was surprised. I think it was really appalling he didn't get his knighthood a lot earlier. I mean, he must have been 75 or 80 when he got it, and uh, that's ridiculous, really. Or perhaps other people get them far too soon. Perhaps that's more accurate. <laughs> Norman Wisdom, or Sir Norman Wisdom. He's been honoured in the two ways that Brightonians honour uh, people with a link to the town, one being the stones inset in the Brighton Marina, which is our little Hollywood walk of fame, and the other one is having your name on a bus. The one thing people seem to know about him is that he's big in Albania. And uh, I didn't quite believe this. It's such an unlikely thing. But uh, I was chatting with my, my pal Tony Hawkes, who was writing a book on his desperate, if not pathetic, quest to get a top 10, or top 20 record somewhere in Europe as a result of some insane bet he'd taken. And I said, well, what you want is a country where you can A, fix the charts, and B, 
where there's somebody who's so big that even if he made a record chewing celery, it would get into the top 20. And I suddenly thought, well, Norman Wisdom. And he did, he was big in Albania. He was so big. Everywhere we went, crowds gathered. And they call him Pitkin there, which was the character he played in most of his movies. Norman Pitkin. And they go, Pitkin, Pitkin. And it really is like Beatlemania. I made my name in many places, a thousand falls, a thousand places, but nowhere's more devoted than Albania. But they've got Norman Mania. And they didn't know you at all. Nobody knew me in Albania. It's <laughs> terrible. But I love Albania back. He is the epitome, he is the ideal that everybody who works in comedy for a living would like to be. Someone who creates a character that's instantly recognisable, very hard to do, you know. Someone who's good at everything he does, who is extremely nice to everybody on stage and off stage. And in his 90th year, he's still as fit as a flea. When Norman walks into a room, it's funny. When he tries to explain something to the audience, it's funny. When he eats an apple in his act, it's funny. He's a true clown. <laughs> While there's no doubt that Norman loves to see his name in lights and will work tirelessly to keep it there, the reason he's so committed is that he loves people. He loves the attention because it makes him feel good, but he knows that if people are watching him, the chances are that they are enjoying themselves. And that isn't a bad philosophy, is it? Someday, maybe, my star will shine. Oh, no.